now, if you would please, let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John. Just kidding. Just kidding. We're going to open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 5 and verse 43. Matthew 5 and 43. Uh, Once you've found the place, or if you're going to follow along on the screen, if you're able, please let us rise for the reading of Scripture. Matthew 5 and 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Would you bow your hearts with me, please, for just a moment? Blessed Father, in these next few moments, may you take these poor, humble, halting words of mine and infuse them with your greatness. May you teach your people the message you would have them to hear, that above all things, Father, your name would be glorified. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen. Do you ever stand up to do a thing and feel entirely inadequate to the task? This morning we reach the last of the you have heard it said, but I say to you passages. A quick search will show you that this is the only place in the entire Bible where you will find the phrase, hate your enemy. So when Jesus says, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, again, he's not somehow correcting Scripture. He's correcting the rabbis who have taught Scripture badly, even if they have the best intentions about it. It's really, really easy to get caught up in tradition. To do things the way they have always been done, and then to lose the reason we did them that way in the first place. Two examples of this. To this very day, the Jews have mourned the holiday called Tisha B'Av, It's on our calendars. It was August 6th and 7th of this year, sundown to the 6th to sundown on the 7th. The holiday remembers the destruction of both the first and second temples. The first falling in 587 B.C., the second falling in 70 A.D. The name of the holiday, Tisha B'Av, means simply the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. We call our months September and January. We name them after Greek and Roman gods. The Hebrews have a a month called Av and another called Nisan. But if you read in Jeremiah chapter 52, you'll realize that the first temple fell on the eighth day of Av, not the ninth. I was puzzled by this because I know the Jews make a big deal out of Tisha B'Av, saying that both temples fell on that same day of the year. I asked a Jewish friend, 
Why? And she told me bluntly, because Jews are practical people. By that, she simply meant that they do things for practical purposes, mourning the fall of both temples on the same day rather than mourning for two consecutive days. Now, lest you think this is a Jewish thing, we Christians are also practical people. We celebrate the death of Christ on Good Friday and celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday. And if you really stretch it, you can fit three days between Friday and Sunday, but there is no way at all that you can fit three nights between them. I know this is one of my intellectual hobby horses, and I just keep getting on it and rocking back and forth once in a while. But, but we celebrate Good Friday and Easter Sunday because it's practical. We work all week, and then we truncate the crucifixion into uh, and, and crucifixion and the resurrection into two easy to observe days on the weekend when we're not doing anything else. We even have Christian scholars who have forgotten that this is a convenience thing and try to defend a Friday crucifixion. Now, I'm sure we'll get more to this in April of uh, the coming year. But I've said all that to say this. What we hear from our teachers, we often accept as pure truth. Then we become teachers ourselves, and while we're writing our lesson plans or our sermons or whatever it is we happen to be teaching, we repeat what we have heard. Sometimes those stories evolve. They change over time. A teacher will add something, sometimes as an incredibly funny joke, like you hear me make frequently. But sometimes just to embellish, thank you for, for smiling, Brent. Sometimes just to embellish things a little bit or to try to make them more clear or to emphasize a point. Not intending to change the story in any way, but the next person sitting in the class, the congregation, the whatever, will learn from that. And when they become a teacher, they'll teach it the way they were taught over time. The story changes. Eventually, when enough time goes past, it has very little to do with the original stories. This is why we must always go back to the Scriptures to test everything we hear from our teachers, just as Luke tells us in Acts 17 and 11. But of course, we're all literate. We have several Bibles on our shelves and hundreds of Bibles on our computers or our phones or our tablets. We can go and check up on things even in languages we don't speak through the use of sites like Blue Letter Bible and Bible Hub. So we don't have to rely on those teachers. We don't have to rely on what we have heard that it was said. That's a long way to go to get back to the text here, I think, but useful. Where Jesus says in Matthew 5 and 43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Because, as I said earlier, this is the only place in the Bible where the phrase, Hate your enemy, appears. Whoever taught that, whatever rabbi taught that you should hate your enemy, and and by the way, Some rabbis still teach that to this very day. Whatever rabbi taught that was not teaching what the Bible says, but rather what they had heard from their teachers. The caustic tradition of the Pharisees explained the word neighbor as meaning friend, and inferring from it, perhaps in connection with Deuteronomy 5, 17 through 19, that every enemy should be hated. They inferred that from something that they read. They inferred that every enemy should be hated as a principle. Now, some scholars believe that the command to destroy the Canaanites was later used by the rabbis to justify hating anyone who was not Jewish, but we don't see that in the text, and that may be, as I said, a later evolution or legendary development. Details added to a teaching over time, which caused that teaching to drift further and further from its original meaning. But here, Jesus is correcting what the rabbis are saying. And he's doing it in the most extreme way possible. He says, 
Don't hate your enemies. Love them. And if they persecute you, pray for them. I have to admit, whenever someone does something mean to me, my first thought is not to pray for them. (laughs) I say this to my shame. Moving on. In Matthew 5 and 44, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Why does Jesus tell us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us? He tells us to do that in order that we may be sons of our Father who is in heaven. Now here, again, the Greek word is specifically sons. Ladies, Jesus is not giving you permission to hate your neighbor. But rather, he's calling you to the highest position in a Jewish household. Not that men are better or greater than women, but that rather the son of the household received the greatest share of the inheritance. When a woman was married off in that culture, she would be given a dowry, a sum of money that was hers. And if she were divorced from that family, her husband would be required to return to her her dowry. But that was all she got. When the father of the household died, the inheritance was distributed to the sons, not the daughters. Jesus isn't prescribing this. He's not telling us this is the way we should do it. He is describing it. He's telling us the way that things are in that culture. The position of inheritance, the chief position among the family, goes to the sons. Now, this is the same Greek word that Jesus uses in Matthew 5 and 9, which we remember, where he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's also the same reward, that if you love your enemies, that if you pray for those who persecute you, you are a son of God. It holds the same position of prominence. This is the final section of the passage. This is the last of the, you have heard it said, but I say to you statements. Now, there were six of them. They were anger, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love. This is the last of them. And like the Beatitudes, this is the pinnacle of them. The reward is the same. Love your enemies. And pray for them so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Now, something to note here. None of these six commandments, none of these six principles, none of these pericopes have anything to do with dealing with God. They don't tell us how to worship or how to pray or what sacrifices to make. These last well, six messages, including this one, have been less theology and more practicality, what to do, when, and why. Jesus is correcting the rabbis, of course, but he's also teaching the law of Moses, not correcting it, because it is largely about how to get along with people, how to live life well. That may be why there are six of them. We noticed, we spoke earlier about how he was copying some of the Ten Commandments, but he skipped over some. There's no uh, prohibition here against stealing, for example, which in the Ten Commandments comes after anger and before adultery. But there are six of these, you have heard it said, but I say to you statements, because six is the number of men. It was on the sixth day of creation that humanity was created And in the Revelation, at the end of time, the number of man is six and six and six. Now, moving on. In verse 45, we have this last sentence, which Jesus inserts here as a kind of argument for or a defense of his last statement. The sun rises, the rain falls, both on the just and the unjust. That's what he's 
using to defend his statement. That is, God sends his blessings on all persons, on Jew and Gentile, on just and unjust, on saint and on sinner. And if God sends his blessings to everyone, who are we to withhold our blessings from them? What right do I have to treat someone badly when God himself showers blessings of sun and rain on that person? This is challenging to the Jews standing there because not only do they have the Romans among them, but they have those nasty, filthy, half-breed Samaritans just across the lake and those horrible, enslaving Egyptians to their south. And just a little further east, they've got the wicked pagan Babylonians. They're surrounded by their enemies. They are surrounded on nearly every side by people who have at one time or another hated them or impressed, uh, oppressed them or enslaved them or have torn apart the law of Moses for their own selfish reasons. And on these wicked, nasty, wretched, disgusting, filthy, miserable people, God sends his blessings of sun and rain. If we love our brothers only, then do we do what or then we do what God has not done. We deny our love, our blessing, our joy to those upon whom God showers his. Jesus makes this argument in verses 46 and 47. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. God blesses those who do not, do not love you with light and life and love and rain and family and crops and livestock and wind and sleep. <gasps> and you can't be bothered to love them? God blesses those who are not your brothers with all the good things in life. And you cannot even be bothered to greet them on the street when you pass by them. What you're doing is no better than the Gentiles, those who are not your brothers, do anyway. There's no difference between you and those Gentiles your rabbis tell you to hate. That's what this is saying. That's what Jesus is telling us. There is no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Gentiles who do not have God's law, the Jews do have it, but neither Jew nor Gentile obeys. They are effectually the same. As Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. A few chapters later in Romans 5 and 10, Paul says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more, or much more now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his life? This verse in Romans 5 and 10 is not talking about our enemies here on earth. It's not talking about those enslaving Egyptians or those filthy Samaritans or the wicked Babylonians. And I say all of that tongue in cheek. It's talking about God himself. This verse is telling us that we were enemies with God and that, en and that enmity between us and God was ended by the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus calls us to love our enemies in order that we would be like him. Him who loved us. Him who gave himself for us while we were yet sinners and in our rebellion against him. In Adam's sin, we made ourselves enemies of God. In our own sin, we continue in that rebellion. And yet, to most Beautiful words in the English language, dearly beloved, the two most beautiful words. But Jesus. But Jesus comes. 
while we are still sinners, while we were wrapped up in our sinfulness and takes upon himself our sin, bearing it to the cross. As the ultimate sacrifice, Christ bleeds and dies, making propitiation for our sin and offering to us his righteousness. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. And then, then there's a verse I didn't even get to in my notes. The last verse in this passage, I didn't even get to it. Because Jesus says, you must therefore be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. He's quoting from Leviticus, where Moses says, I am holy, therefore you should be holy. Dearly beloved, when I began to understand that, I, I nearly abandoned Christianity altogether. I can't do it. I've tried. I know I've told this story before, but please forgive me. I'll tell it again, and I'll probably tell it again after this. So get used to it. It's a good story. One day I tried to be sinless. I woke up in the morning. I slept in very late because I, I, I wanted to shorten my day as much as possible. I just decided that I was going to be sinless that day. So I woke up that morning and I went out onto my front porch to watch the sun that had already risen long ago. And I sat on my porch and I read my Bible and I prayed and I wept. And then I went inside to make myself some brunch. And I listened to some Christian music that I loved. And I worshiped and I praised and I prayed because I was so focused on being sinless this one single day. And I, and I ate an easy short breakfast or brunch, and then I, I went back to my Bible, and I, I sat and I watched a Christian movie. There's some, some really good stuff out there. And, and, and I, I went back to my Bible, and I spent the day in, in prayer and, and, and meditation and in Scripture reading. And that evening, as I sat waiting for the end of the day, the Jewish day, dearly beloved, not the Gentile day, I was waiting for the sun to go down and call it done, sat on my porch with my Bible in my lap, and I thought about how wonderful I had been the whole day, how good I had done, how proud I was of my sinless state, and then I saw it all for what it was, a house of cards held up by my own pride. The one day in my life I tried harder than any other day in my life to be sinless, I was wallowing in the sin of my own pride the whole day. One day I tried to be perfect. Never mind my whole life. Never mind the, the days past when I was in college or in the army or high school, or elementary school, never mind those days when I was out and doing things and, and, and going places I shouldn't have gone. One day, I tried to be perfect and I failed. So when Jesus tells you to be perfect, the cynic in me wants to say, good luck with that. But the theologian in me understands what Jesus is saying. All of these commandments, all of these new understandings of the Mosaic law, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, do not even be angry with your brother. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lust in his heart 
You have heard it said, but I tell you. And all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before the true standard that is Jesus Christ Himself. So then how do we obey? We who are made of tainted stuff, how do we obey? We who are broken, we who are in continual rebellion against the God of heaven, what does it mean when Jesus says to us, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect? What does it mean when Moses says to us, Be you therefore holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. It means to die. To die to ourselves and to live in Christ. Because Christ himself came and bore the cross He took upon Himself our own sinfulness, our own unrighteousness, our own wretchedness, and He gave to us His garment of righteousness. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But in Christ, we are born again. We are made anew, as Rich Mullen says, out of stuff that lasts. Such a simple line and yet so powerful. We are made anew out of stuff that lasts. Christ killed the hostility between God and man by loving his enemies. You and me. Enough to bear the cross for us. How can we do less? Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. And when you do, you will be sons of your Father in heaven. Amen. Let's bow our hearts.